Hi, I'm Lindsay Odes. Welcome to episode one of Worldviews in Education. This is an online education series brought to you by the Melbourne Graduate School of Education here at the University of Melbourne in Australia. I'm really excited today to introduce to you Dr. Jan Hare, who is both professor and the Dean of Education at the University of British Columbia in Canada. Dr. Hare is known for her approaches to advancing the rights of Indigenous peoples. And we're gonna hear from Dr. Hare in a moment. I want you to look out for two key concepts, which, which were part of my learning, that is the notion of a settler scholar and the idea of right relations. I also challenge you to use those terms in a conversation in the next 72 hours. Please enjoy the presentation and I hope you find it most fruitful. So Bojo Ani Janice Herdish Nikas and Shnabekwe, uh Chiging in Dojiba, Masquiam Akininda. Just a short greeting in my Anishinaabean language. As this map notes, I'm from a small First Nations community in central Canada in northern Ontario. I join you today from the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam people on which the University of British Columbia occupies. UBC is situated in Vancouver here in Western Canada. And you'll note I use an image from an art installation on our campus by Edward Heapabirds that's intended to disrupt our notions of place and shift perceptions on who is host and who is guest on these lands. And I also acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that the University of Melbourne has now come to occupy given this invitation for this presentation comes from colleagues at Melbourne. And here I do want to say miigwech, which is thank you for the invitation to speak with you and in particular uh, gratitude to Dr. Melita Horgath uh, for the opportunity to be part of this series, Worldviews in Education, hosted by the University of Melbourne's Graduate School of Education. As Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Pedagogy, my teaching and research are concerned with how post-secondary institutions can be inclusive of Indigenous knowledges, worldviews, and pedagogies, especially as critiques of higher education have established how commonly the classroom operates as a colonized space in which Indigenous worldviews are marginalized and Indigenous students experience racism and exclusion in knowledge traditions traditions, pedagogical processes, and classroom interactions. Complementary to this is my role for five years as the Associate Dean of Indigenous Education, where I was tasked with advancing Indigenous priorities across a large faculty of education. At that time, I also served as the director of our Indigenous Teacher Education Program, NITEP for that time, and I am now the Dean Pro Tem of the Faculty of Education here at UBC. Indigenous education is a critical area of development in faculties of education across Canada and in countries including Australia, New Zealand, and the US. As these countries seek to reconcile colonial histories or colonial settler, set, sorry, colonial settler histories and address disparities in educational outcomes for Indigenous learners. For example, teacher education programs across Canada are experiencing a dramatic shift in the preparation of pre- and in-service teachers as they teach educators how to incorporate Indigenous content, uh, perspectives, and pedagogies in their practice, mobilized by Canada's truth and reconciliation calls to action, uh, as well as changing standards for the profession by teacher regulating bodies and curriculum reform uh, that is occurring on a national scale. From my reading of literature in Australia by leading Indigenous and settler scholars such as Nikki Moody, uh, Melita Horgoth, Tracy Bunda, Lester Irvana Rigney, Peter Buckskin, uh, Bob Morgan, uh, Joe Lambert and Ma Ray and others, I understand teacher education in Australia to also be a critical site for preparing educators to teach Indigenous worldviews and perspectives with a goal towards reconciliation and other policy imperatives, including the Australian uh, professional standards for teaching. And so there are certainly many parallels between Canada and Australia, with the discourse of reconciliation certainly having a longer history in Australia than in Canada. As a result of policy directives 
aimed at teacher education or aimed at teacher development um, of both pre and in service educators, discourses of reconciliation, decolonization, and more recently, indigenization are taking hold alongside discourses of multiculturalism, culturally responsive pedagogy, equity, diversity, and social justice, which Lisa Taylor at the tells us that these uh, discourses have historically and predominantly shaped teacher education. As an Indigenous scholar, educator, and administrator, I've seen the way that these resulting formations of decolonization, reconciliation, and indigenization are being transposed into faculties of education across Canada in their different processes, leadership, and outcomes. In this presentation, I want to first consider the significant discourses informing Indigenous education in teacher education, attending to decolonization, uh, reconciliation, and indigenization, especially as they've become differently positioned, contested, and institutionally sanctioned within teacher education. Even as higher education institutions rhetorically adopt these discourses, Indigenous people must still work strategically within and against these formations to advance their own priorities and aspirations. For this reason, I want to argue for a rights-based approach to advancing Indigenous education priorities in faculties of education that attends to the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. UNDRIP advances Indigenous rights to education, language, and culture on Indigenous terms. Such an approach would create a new relational and political dynamic between educational institutions and Indigenous people. More succinctly, it puts teacher education in right relations with Indigenous people and communities. That is, as settler scholars Graham Hansen, Schaffenacher, and Bentz describe in their conversations on approaches to climate action research, right relations are the obligations of settler societies to live up to responsibilities when part of a relationship. Invoking this concept or mindset for professional learning of in and pre-service teachers, I assert, uh, I assert that the rights of Indigenous people are then relevant to all educators. If teacher education programs are to orientate themselves towards what matters to Indigenous people and it organize responsibilities to Indigenous education through a rights-based approach, teacher education would be grounded in relationality, land-based learning, and pathways for Indigenous students. I'll conclude with a discussion and examples of these three conditions. As I consider teacher education as a specific site to settler accountabilities to right relations, I want to acknowledge that the examples or even strategies <coughs> uh, on which I draw from the Canadian context are certainly relevant to K-12 education. Faculties of education continue to change in profound ways as they respond to urgent calls to decenter whiteness, particularly in teacher education. Teacher education programs have become more intentional in their efforts to create an EDI or equity, diversity and inclusion mindset into the practices of teacher education. So that's including policies, curriculum, teaching and program development to ensure teachers can respond to the diverse needs of learners and create equitable opportunities for all students in their classrooms and school communities. As a result, EDI has fast become a conceptual foundation for teacher education and I would also say K-12 schooling. EDI though has been critiqued as narrow and limiting and in my own leadership, well narrow and limiting in terms of change. So in my own leadership experience, I see how EDI tends to be downloaded to individual colleagues, be it faculty, students, admin support, or administration, rather than addressing the systemic forces that drive inequities. In addition, I see emphasis on enhancing diversity and equity, which obscures efforts to broach the difficult conversations of um, racism and colonialism. 
In fact, we need to consider indigenous perspectives that speak to, as well as offer alternative understandings of EDI that is defined by institutional logic and practices. And finally, EDI fails to recognize the distinctive histories as well as the distinctive sovereignty of indigenous people. As Danica Sterrod Miller points out in Teaching Indigenous Sovereignty in Multicultural America, inclusivity includes people, or she quotes, quotes, includes people, especially indigenous people who may or may not want to be included, end quote. In order for settler societies to think and act differently in their responsibilities towards Indigenous priorities, therefore putting them in right relations, they must, suggests Graham Hansen, Schaffnegger, and Bentz, engage, um, engage with Indigenous paradigms, ontologies, and epistemologies, and that is Indigenous ways of knowing and being. For educational institutions, this means recognizing the contributions of Indigenous knowledges, perspectives, and pedagogies as valid to teaching, learning, and research, and taking these up in their practices as educators. This process of decolonization requires confronting and dismantling the colonial traditions that shape teaching and learning, including what counts as knowledge, uh, what languages we privilege, how knowledge is acquired, and the structures that organize our classrooms and schools. Yet, settler societies like Canada still need to grapple with colonial histories in order to advance Indigenous priorities in education. Since the final release of Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Final Report and the accompanying policy directives in its calls to action, reconciliation has fast become a vehicle for attention, expression, and action, uh, much like it has in Australia. Even as tensions for the possibilities of better relations between Indigenous and settler societies surfaced amid the work of Canada's TRC, I believe that if reconciliation held the moment, it held promise. As an Indigenous scholar, educator, and administrator, I could see the ways reconciliation as a discourse was being transposed into faculties of education and K-12 schooling across Canada. And I continue to observe the strong and focused way this concept takes hold in educational spaces, especially if it facilitates decolonization and, more recently, indigenization. However, like so many other scholars and educators, I've become impatient towards reconciliation. While I appreciate that reconciliation has raised awareness of settler colonial histories, even prompted educators to engage more deeply in reconciliation through their educative practices and pedagogies, it simply has not done enough to dismantle the colonial and normative structures in our education system. In recent work, I question whether reconciliation was hope or just hype. I reflected on whether education was a deeply transformative site for reconciliation, recognizing how debated and diversely understood the concept is for educators. As an Indigenous scholar, teaching Indigenous learners and giving insight, uh, oversight uh, to Indigenous programs, I take issue with the accelerated trend towards reconciliation in education that continues to give focus to indigenous settler relations and less emphasis to the ways post-secondary institutions can be um, more responsive to the aspirations of indigenous learners and accountable to indigenous communities. An increasingly popular approach since Canada's TRC findings and recommendations has been the process of indigenization. According to Canadian scholars Gaudry and Lorenz, the discourse of indigenization common across Canadian post-secondary institutions and in teacher education seeks foundational intellectual and structural transformation through inclusion of indigenous knowledges and communities. In their view, indigenization should be led by indigenous people and respect indigenous intellectual sovereignty in the teaching and study of indigenous knowledges and pedagogies. It is certainly thought of as a more radical approach as it casts its intention towards transformation of an entire university enterprise. 
However, Godry and Lorenz argue post-secondary institutions have mainly settled on a notion of indigenization, that is, and I quote from their work, merely increasing the number of indigenous people on campus through indigenous student enrollment and hiring more indigenous faculty and staff without broader changes. And for anyone interested, a review of their work uh, presents three distinct visions of indigenization for higher education. While decolonization, reconciliation, and, de and indigenization are hopeful and productive processes for educational change, I'm cautious about ascribing importance to a singular framework. For example, uh, Alistair Pennycook and Sean Free McConey point out that decolonization should not be the sole motivating force for change, but uh, because, in as much as there is a desire to center Western knowledge, it is necessary to bear in mind that coloniali colonialism is not the sum total of Indigenous histories. I also recognize the rhetorical way these discourses become part of institutional mindsets and practices in that Indigenous perspectives may become part of teaching and learning, but the organizing structure, structures of educational institutions, um, that is the curriculum, those who teach, uh, assessment, still remain the same. I propose right relations as an approach or even a mindset as this global series takes up so that settler societies can live up to their obligations as part of being in a relationship with Indigenous people, whether those obligations are set out um, in treaty or land agreements or commitments expressed in other policy directives. If educational institutions are to take seriously the responsibilities of advancing Indigenous educational priorities, then we need to look to the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. UNDRIP has 47 articles pertaining to Indigenous self-determination in all areas uh, of their lives, including education. And I've shared a few of the articles here in this slide. UNDRIP asserts that Indigenous peoples have the right to establish and control their own education system and that states or governments must provide education to Indigenous learners that reflect their cultures and languages. These rights are inherent in that they have uh, been permanent and cannot be taken away. <coughs> The Government of Canada has introduced legislation to implement UNDRIP through Bill C-15, which calls on laws to be consistent with the Declaration. It has received royal assent and became law in 2021. Bill C-15 intends to address injustices, combat prejudice, and eliminate all forms of violence and discrimination, including systemic discrimination against Indigenous people. Further, all relations with Indigenous people would be based on the recognition of self-determination. In the province of British Columbia, where uh, I teach, work, and live, uh, Canada, uh, which is in Western Canada, UNDRIP became legislation through the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. And so there is a declaration plan with goals and outcomes to form a long-term vision for the implementation of UNDRIP in this province. In this plan, there are 89 uh, action priorities that seek to ensure, one, Indigenous people's rights to self-determination and self-government, two, Indigenous people uh, exercise inherent rights to, their, uh, to own, use, and control lands and resources in their territories, three, uh, express their distinct rights in this province without interference, oppression, or inequities associated with racism or discrimination, and four, to maintain, control, develop, uh, protect, and transmit their cultural heritage, knowledges, and languages. It also takes a distinctions-based approach, which requires the government to work with each indig uh, sorry to work with each indigenous group uh, in the province in a manner that acknowledges each have different interests, priorities, concerns, and specific rights. And for Canada, this is significant given we have three uh, distinct indigenous groups across Canada, which are First Nations, Métis, and the Inuit. Further, any agreements formed are carried out by joint or consent-based decision-making with roles and responsibilities for governments and Indigenous bodies. 
And so I, I gave a few examples here of some articles and what government ministry then takes responsibility. The challenge for Indigenous people in British Columbia may not be the recognition of Indigenous rights, but commitments by government to apply and uphold these rights in timely and meaningful ways. A rights-based approach through, un un through UNDRIP would expect educational institutions to be knowledgeable and willing to accept the unique legal and political status of Indigenous people and nations, which sets them apart from other national, social, and racial groups. As Indigenous people redefine the role of formal education to align with their goals of self-determination and sovereignty, so too must educational institutions if they are to be held accountable to Indigenous aspirations. So for teacher education, I want to suggest, I want to suggest that such an approach would embody relationality, land education, and pathways for Indigenous learners. And I'll draw from teacher education in Canada to describe the possibilities of this new dynamic with Indigenous people and communities that help us understand our collective responsibilities towards creating a socially just education on Indigenous lands. We generally approach Indigenous education with largely settler uh, students by having them learn about their own positionalities in relationship to settler colonial history and where they examine their own entanglements or investments in colonialism, along with strategies that disrupt their stances of what La Nape uh, scholar Suzanne Dion calls the perfect stranger or what uh, Tuck and Yang describe as settler moves to innocence. Further, much attention in the scholarship has given, uh, is given to the way educators take up Indigenous knowledges, perspectives, and pedagogies uh, in their practice. At the core of this work is relationality. Relationality is central to Indigenous worldviews and the way we engage with people, the land, ancestors, and the world around us. It emphasizes interconnectedness that is organized by Indigenous values, worldviews, teachings, and practices. And I'm drawn to uh, a recent article by Maxi Moran Dulce, um, Alka uh, Kaiser, and Elliot Grove's work, uh, who tell us that Indigenous ways of knowing and being emerge from collaboration with others in the Indigenous community. So if we consider the potential of relationality to encompass converging spaces for collaboration as they, su as they suggest, uh, we would then extend this to include meaningful engagement with Indigenous people, uh, not just as co-creators of curriculum or teaching and learning, but as rights holders. And as rights holders, they become decision makers, participating through education agreements, developing mandated provincial or state curriculum for use in schools, and identify and develop mechanisms that enable school districts to better support Indigenous learners. <coughs> and here I want to draw your attention to a shirk funded or here in Canada government funded project that takes seriously how to mobilize local pedagogies through co-curricular making with university researchers led by Dr. Margaret McIntyre Latta and I'm part of this research as well at the University of British Columbia on our Okanagan uh, campus or at the Okanagan School of Education and with Indigenous community partners. And these are all situated in the territory of the Silks uh, people in the interior of BC. While the project certainly gestures towards reconciliation and decolonization, it is the co-curricular making practices that focus on principles uh, that define and inform Silks rights and responsibilities to the land uh, and to the culture that move this project towards sovereign goals. And these principles include grounding curriculum in Silk's place, supporting uh, educator professional inquiry through engagement with Silk's knowledge keepers, elders, and extended community, in reconceptualizing the curriculum of teacher education. It empowers not only educators, but in the Indigenous community. And there is a, a shared uh, research platform that is being created for the benefit of the Silks community and the School uh, of Education. And there is a chat, uh, sorry, there is a link uh, for this project on this slide. 
I turn now to land-based education as a second condition or strategy by which educational institutions can uphold obligations to Indigenous priority. Land education described by Tuck, McKenzie, and McCoy is both a theoretical and pedagogical framework that situates Indigenous epistemology and ontologies at the center. This includes Indigenous understandings of land, the intimate relationship of languages, Indigenous languages, to the land, and Indigenous critiques of settler colonialism. Also, as other scholars point out, land is sentient, alive, holding ancestral connections uh, to more uh, than the physical and material dimensions of place. Uh, for the work of Indigenous scholars such as Megan Bang, Dolores Cauldron, Brian Brayboy, Sandra Styers, and others, land education problematizes the relationship between land and settler colonialism, uncovering how settler colonial projects are maintained and produced. Uh, for Cauldron in particular, um, she points out that land education takes into account Indigenous rights and sovereignty, as well as environmental and ecological sensibilities as priorities. Now, there are certainly a growing number of programs and initiatives inspired by Indigenous perspectives on land education. And as an example here is um, one of land education and teacher education um, being led by Indigenous Papachis or Cree scholar Dwayne Donald uh, in the Faculty of Ed Education at the University of Alberta, who together with Cree elder and assistant adjunct professor Bob Cardinal have offered the course holistic approaches to learning. The course was designed over the duration of the four season cycle to give expression to the patterns of life and living on the land through the 13 moon cycle. So instead of sitting in a classroom, students spend time or spend course time together at Elder Cardinal's teaching lodge. They take part in ceremony and spend time outside where they build relationships with the land and one another while learning in experiential and holistic ways. And a documentary of the course was filmed and I encourage people to look at the background uh, of the course uh, as well as um, learning much about how the uh, course unfolds and student responses and again a link to the video is here on this slide. Finally, I suggest a third condition for right relations that engages with teacher education, and this is creating pathways to teacher education for Indigenous students. Indigenous learners, schools, and communities have unique histories, concerns, priorities, and values that must be acknowledged in shaping the preparation of teachers for Indigenous community-controlled settings, uh, reservations, and public schools. Indigenous teachers play a significant role in creating environments that are culturally responsive, empowering, inclusive of Indigenous knowledges, and promote sovereignty. Indigenous-led teacher education programs, or ITEPs, situated, with, uh, situated within mainstream teacher education, have, a, have long played a significant role in preparing Indigenous teacher candidates to serve Indigenous learners in communities. However, preparing Indigenous teacher candidates to address the broader needs of Indigenous peoples as learners, parents, and community re does require different program designs in teacher education. And I, I'm going to say there are just so many good examples for me to draw on here in Canada. There is the NITEP program, which is the Indigenous Teacher Education Program at the University of British Columbia. Um, ATEP, which is at the University of Alberta, SUNTAP, um, but there's also a range of new Indigenous-led teacher education models emerging, such as the urban program WABON uh, out of York University and the Build From Within model, um, <coughs> which is at the University of Winnipeg. And uh, this fall, I will be hosting an international symposium on Indigenous-led teacher education uh, here at UBC. And, and I'm really pleased that several programs from Australia will be in attendance, including Curtin's On Country Teacher Education Pro Program and the Partnership Program, uh, RayTap, which is the remote, uh, remote area teacher education program with James Cook University. ITEPs engage in practices that are self-determining, sustaining, empowering, and autonomous at the community level, revitalizing 
uh, Indigenous languages, drawing on local knowledges for teaching and learning, engaging family and community, connecting to land and place and elders, and giving authority to Indigenous communities in designing and delivering programs or delivering programming are really key uh, tenets of ITEP programming. However, when located in mainstream teacher education, ITEPs can struggle for support of sovereignty, self-determination, and tribal nation building in preparation of educators. If, it, if and Just in conclusion, if educational institutions defended uh, Indigenous rights to education, language, and culture, then Indigenous priorities of self-determination and sovereignty expressed in control over their lands, resources, and knowledges could also be upheld. Suggesting a rights-based approach assumes that faculties of education recognize and enact responsibilities to promote and uphold Indigenous rights. What I've suggested is that current discourses of education risk uh, constraining these commitments. As ongoing forms of colonialism, such discourses operating in faculties of education fail to address the deeply entrenched racism and inequities experienced by Indigenous people, nor do they attend to Indigenous sovereignty. Even the more progressive discourses um, that I've shared may hold promise for Indigenous education, but have been slow to move Indigenous, pers move indigenous perspectives and priorities forward. Given the tenuous relationship of such discourses with that of self-determination and sovereignty, I've highlighted relationality, land education, and educational opportunities for Indigenous learners as specific strategies for teacher education and for educators to be living in right relations. I just want to share some of the references here uh, that I've drawn upon uh, to shape this conversation today. And would like to conclude with miigwech, which is thank you in my language. <laughs>